Hello, everyone. On behalf of the ASLA NCC chapter, welcome and thank you for joining the finale of our 2021 Lunch with Leaders Industry Icon Series with today's guest, David Walker. My name is Krista Van Hove. I'm a campus planner at Stanford and past president of the chapter. Helping me host today's session, we have Charlie Yu, who works with David at PWP and is on our chapter executive committee, and Laura Luer, the chapter executive director. I wanna take a moment to acknowledge all the hard work of our lecture series committee this year, Todd Coley, Carrie Cow, Charlie Yu, and Rick Hendricks, with a special thank you to all our past icons that presented and everyone in our audience. We could not have made this year's success without all of you. I'd like to take a moment before we get started to introduce you to your new chapter president, Siobhan Hussey, with a couple of exciting announcements. Thank you, Krista. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Siobhan Hussey, and I'm your new chapter president this year. As mentioned, we have some exciting news to share. First off, we are only eight days away from our last event of the year. We will be hosting our president's reception in person next Thursday, December 9th at 6.30 p.m. Early registration prices for the event end on Friday, so please sign up before the prices increase. This is going to be a fun event, so we hope to see all your smiling faces next Thursday in Oakland at Rosenblum Cellars. And for our big announcement, ASLA National has had some changes to their schedule for the annual conference next year, and our chapter is now going to be the host for the 2022 National Conference. How exciting! <laughs> the dates will be released soon since this has been a last minute pivot. So with this, we are doing a call for volunteers. If you have any interest in helping us hold host field sessions or would like to chair or volunteer for a conference committee, please put your email in the chat. A more formal announcement and description of roles will be emailed out next week. So please be on the lookout for that. We need all of you to pull this off. Back to you, Krista. Thanks, Siobhan. And one last announcement, if you missed any of our past lecture series, you can find the recordings on the ASLANCC.org website. Stay, stay tuned for our 2022 lineup. Meanwhile, you can anticipate our next online lecture will be in February with Stanford University's Director of Landscape Architecture, Kathy Blake. I think she's on the line with us today. She will kick off the new year with a 200 year celebration of Olmsted through the campus master plan. And for a couple of housekeeping tips for today's session, um, we will have the Q&A at the end. So please utilize the chat to submit any questions during the presentation. And if you are comfortable, please turn on your cameras. We love to see everyone. And now I would like to introduce you to David Walker. He is a fellow of ASLA and a design partner with over 30 years of experience working closely with his father, Peter Walker. He has led numerous projects ranging in scale, budget, and design character, bringing both design vision and project know-how to the realization of projects around the world. David has spent the last 15 years leading many of the large international design projects in their office and has been the recipient of numerous design awards. Recent projects include Barangaroo in Sydney, which we will hear more about today, the National 9-11 Memorial in New York, and corporate campus headquarters for companies such as Novartis, Samsung Electronics, VMware, Pixar Animation Studios, and LinkedIn. David, you're not only carrying on the legacy and design tradition within your family, from your father to your own son, but you are committed to engaging your community through design and education from the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world. We are excited to learn from your global experience and travel to Australia with you during our lunch break today. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to have an opportunity to talk to everybody and uh, really look at uh, a project in depth and how we get these big things done, which I think is something that <clears throat> is, I think, hopefully useful to everybody. Um, so I'll start right in. Um, you know. For all of you that don't know much about our firm, um, 
We're about 35 landscape architects, which all sit under one roof, as you can see here in this large warehouse in Berkeley. There's nothing particularly special about our firm, uh, just a tight knit group of people that are committed to an exceptional portfolio of projects, building on our past experiences with uh, the ongoing design guidance of its founders. We don't have a sophisticated marketing strategy, rather we rely on our past experience to create a positive design outcome for each unique site. And our primary goal as designers lies in the success of the built work. There we go. Um, the focus of today's talk uh, will be specific to the making of Barangaroo Reserve, which was a massive undertaking by the new South Wales government to reinvent the Sydney foreshore for the 21st century. Um, building Barangaroo was an opportunity to build on my past 30 years of experience working with my dad, my dad's past 60 years of experience. And just like the World Trade Center was a kind of call to action that required vast amounts of project know-how, producing an outcome uh, which elevated our landscape practice onto the world stage. Barangaroo was the next design opportunity that in many ways was a much more complex challenge. All of our projects are difficult to create. Uh, a memorial, uh, a memorable result, result, but the memorial tested our endurance for a, a string of very large projects that would require upwards of 10 years of building stamina for design advocacy and the shifting politics of stakeholders and political leaders. I want to show, show a few more projects that have been some of my precedent experiences leading up to Barangaroo. Steve Jobs' first corporate campus is a nice it, Sorry. Excuse us, we're doing something technical here. That's fine. Steve Jobs' first uh, corporate campus is a seven is a seven acre rolling green park modeled after the landscape landscapes that he grew up with in Silicon Valley. A former industrial site was transformed into oak forests, apple orchards, and a sycamore alley. The park contains company amenities, including organic vegetable gardens, a soccer field an amphitheater, a swimming pool, and a casual walk, walking circuit through a landscape composed for the most part of California natives. The naturalistic park was designed as a great playground for a creative company. The Central LA Walk connects pedestrians with the headquarters and open play fields. Informal groves and an informal walk allow for multiple, um, multiple access for the employees. This is one of many uh, collaborations with Helmut Jan, which I had the opportunity to work on, in which the landscape solutions are closely aligned with the architecture. PWP designed a glass bottomed cantilevered reflecting pool that would reveal Helmut's now, now iconic tent structure above and connect the theater lobby below to the street level plaza above, which was made out of stainless steel and cobblestone. Sony Center is one of the great public meeting places in Potsdamer Platz, a grand renewal of one of Berlin's important urban centers. The space is used for many cultural events, including public viewing of important football matches and the Berlin International Film Festival. And it just so happens that we're currently involved in a major up updating of our now 21 year old project for the new owners of the estate. More recently, we've been involved with Silicon Valley campus projects. This one is a is for VMware's headquarters in Palo Alto. And we are uh, just finishing the first headquarters for LinkedIn in Mountain View, which is opening next month. Novartis campus in Basel, Switzerland is perhaps our most elaborate campus project. I worked on it for 16 years, which is a testament uh, for the sheer willpower that is required to get a great outcome. But when you have a company who's willing to fly you to Basel four to six times a year, you know you have an extraordinary client. We built a whole array of, of different gardens and plazas. Um, this one is the courtyard in the middle of the Novartis head, headquarters building. Uh, and this is the forum, a kind of town square modeled after the historic town square at the center of Basel uh, at the Munster Platz. It was designed to look uh, like it had existed historically to give a strong memory as the center of the pharmaceutical empire. A lot was learned about the spacing of very large tree species when we were at the time uh, in the middle of designing the World Trade Center Memorial. This, is, uh, this one is a plaza at the end of the secure entrance passage that connects 
France to Switzerland and a dramatic entry to the northern edge of the campus where people ascended out of the underground passage to be enveloped by the placement of this extraordinary Richard Serra sculpture. The Jameson Square Fountain has filled a demographic void uh, in Portland by attracting parents with young, younger children from all ar around the city to the new Pearl District. The new neighborhood was originally marketed to empty nesters moving back to the city center from the suburbs, but it is now a highly desirable neighborhood for families. A surging spring of water pours out of this stone escarpment and fills a semicircular uh, circle of, of gently sloped paving to create an intermittent pool and a kind of urban beach. The project gained immediate and overwhelming popularity with parents and small children. This is kind of a good springboard uh, with the obvious design, uh, design analogy as a pre precedent for how we developed almost one kilometer of new foreshore in Sydney Harbor. And so we'll depart from the preamble about Barangaroo and, uh, and, and get right into how we created Barangaroo and what, um, what this is all about. This is the story about a large, about large scale city building on the most historical, historically significant, stunningly beautiful and, and valuable parcels of land in downtown Sydney, Australia. Um, beginning in the, in the mid 19th century, a long portion of the foreshore of Sydney Harbor was filled in to create space for maritime industrialization. This practice generated sandstone materials for the early building construction of Sydney, but it also replaced the historic Millers Point headland with a flat rectangular container port by the 1960s. Former Australian Prime Minister Paul Kidding uh, announced the client brief to recreate the headland that originally existed on this site as it would have been imagined prior to 1836 before English settlement of Australia began. Further, the brief developed from the idea to create an architectural monument to the indigenous people of Sydney Harbor. The project would be named Barangaroo after a powerful Gadigal woman and a key leader in the local Aboriginal community, community when the first Europeans settled in Sydney. The most important principles that would be followed included the recreated Headland Park was to be established uh, entirely naturalistic, restricting architectural elements, and to follow the approximate shape and form of the headland as recorded in historical maps and paintings. This new urban park would need to be built to modern code, and therefore, and therefore it was impossible to be made purely natural, a natural uh, re recreation. A cultural center was to be concealed below the landscape and to follow the topography of the headland form. A foreshore walk was to inspire was to inspire to a civic scale in keeping with the great public promenades of Sydney and to, to last a hundred years. And it needed to be continuous, connecting the last remaining waterfront edge, which had been, not, been denied public access for more than a hundred years. When we began to think about the client brief, we immediately realized that our effort was uh, to invent an Australian landscape that would have similar importance as the existing iconic points in Sydney Harbor, including the Sydney Opera House, considered an international icon, and the Sydney Harbor Bridge, considered a national icon. Our goal then was to create a monumental land landscape dedicated to the past and present indigenous people of Sydney Harbor. Former Prime Minister uh, Paul Keating's original words about the container port always stayed with me. He spoke of the industrial port as being a man-made industrial scar on the harbor that could be seen from outer space. He went on to say that for the future of Sydney, we must restore this dedicated, desiccated, sacred ground. This industrial remnant needed to be completely eliminated from memory. And this is the outcome of our work in 2015. You can see the re recreated headland in the foreground and the partially developed high-rise buildings of Barangaroo South in the background. You can see a cove separating Barangaroo Reserve from what will be the third and final phase of the development fitting into central Barangaroo. And here, and here you can see in full focus the 5.7 acre Barangaroo Reserve in its completed form as a new iconic Sydney landscape occupying the space 
where the headland originally stood alongside the Sydney Harbor Bridge and the Sydney Opera House at Benelong Point. Barangaroo was the wife of Benelong where the Opera House is located. And Benelong was the Abri Aboriginal leader that Captain Cook first met when he sailed into Sydney Harbor. So it is a meaningful uh, recognition that provides great historic significance to these two points as bookends for the, the historic downtown of Sydney. The Barangaroo site has a long and rich history before and after Captain Cook sailed into Botany Bay, which began the colonization of Australia. We found ourselves immersed in the context of 200 years of history that had been mostly erased on the site, but was actively being uh, preserved in the Rocks neighborhood that is adjacent to the project site. In addition to the history that remains in the adjacent neighborhood, these images are the most important historic references our team used to define the starting point of the design which included Major Taylor's 1822 panoramic view of Sydney, the earliest depiction painted at the time before the existence of photography, early 1836 maps made of the area, and a diagram of the five headlands that surrounded Goat Island in the middle, the sacred fishing grounds for Barangaroo and the indigenous people of Sydney Harbor. This is an, entire, an early perspective drawing depicting colonial Sydney and the historic Miller's Point neighborhood. This pre-industrial photograph shows that the native vegetation of Miller's Point headland had been replaced by colonial structures, fine-grained streets, and laneways centered around a beautiful town square called Argyle Place. The yellow areas on the left approximate uh, the, the yellow areas on the left approximate the structures that were eliminated from Miller's Point in the early 20th century to make way for industrial maritime purposes. The neighborhood was literally quarried away to provide much of, of the sandstone materials for constructing the great institutional buildings in Sydney. It was transformed into dense maritime industrial warehouses while the rest of Barangaroo was developed as finger wharves supporting the heart of Sydney's port activity. By the 1950s, the finger wharves were eliminated and the 25 hectare site reached its final industrialized state as a modern container port. The cliff faces in this photo makes a clear delineate, delineation of what remained of the rich Sydney hip, history. There's a dramatic grade change from the top of, of Observatory Hill down to the harbor, and the gradual excavation for the flat container port left large cliff faces that physically separated it from the rest of the city. Our first effort was to define and reestablish all the east-west urban connections that connect, reconnect the city with the waterfront. The red area indicates the 25 hectare, three district Barangaroo development area, which had been uh, publicly accessible for more than hundred years. When Barangaroo is complete, it will reconnect uh, the larger, the, lar the last major waterfront connection to the city from Woolamaloo to Darling Harbor and beyond. This citywide map defines all the east-west connections possible from the center of the city, all connecting to the Barangaroo foreshore promenade. The 22 hectare, $6 billion uh, Barangaroo precinct will redefine the western edge of Sydney Harbor and be a lasting legacy for future generations. Barangaroo will provide space for over 24,000 permanent jobs, gener generate approximately 2 billion per year to the New South Wales economy and provide over 11 hectares of newly accessible public domain. The site's three development areas, Barangaroo Reserve, Central Barangaroo and Barangaroo South combine recreational high rise uh, commercial development with residential and civic spaces to create a stimulating network of new landmark landmarks on Sydney's waterfront. Access along the existing urban edge has been maximized with direct access points. A 200 space car park under Barangaroo Reserve, bridges, staircases, a new pedestrian tunnel linked to Winyard train station, new ferry service, and a new underground metro stop. Once finished in 2022, which I think is, not, is uh, being delayed because of the pandemic, uh, a number of years uh, because of the planning being stalled out. 
half of Barangaroo will be uh, public space encompassing a continuous 2.5 kilometer waterfront walkway, uh, new parks, plazas, and coves connecting the central business district and the historic rocks neighborhood to the harbor. The Barangaroo plan will transform what was an inaccessible industrial backside of the city into a continuously accessible public domain and Western face of Sydney. On August 22nd, 2020, uh, 2015, Barangaroo Re Reserve was the first phase in the, three in the three district master plan to open to the public. In this rendering, you can see the three distinct zones of Barangaroo. Barangaroo Reserve at the north is 100% public open space. Center Central Barangaroo will be 50% open space and Barangaroo South is mostly urban. A view from Barangaroo South with the proposed ferry terminal, and uh, which is now built, and Barangaroo Reserve in the background. Central Barangaroo is viewed from Bar as viewed from Barangaroo Reserve with Nawi Cove making a distinct physical separation. The cultural space for the cutaway is concealed below the landscape and follows the re recreated headland form. Here you can see a great shot of the entry, the bottom of the screen. Inspired by the many sandstone platforms of Sydney headland, Sydney's headlands in the harbor historically used by aborig aboriginals for shelter, the space is a natural setting for an indigenous cultural center. The void that forms the cutaway was deepened as sandstone blocks were quarried on site and moved to create the new sandstone foreshore sandstone flanked staircases and park outcroppings. The cutaway provides an internal space for 5,500 people and a two level car park beneath the facility. But it is, but it is also an engineering masterpiece, the largest uh, uh, subterranean internal space in Australia and all located beneath 12,000 cubic meters of rock, grass and mature trees. Above is a cross section of Barangaroo Reserve showing the cutaway below. The entire existing cliff face can be seen exposed along the eastern perimeter of the space. The plan describes an accessible lawn sloping up gently from the north, culminating in a steep southern slope. This plan shows the cutaway below exposed with the parking and service access from the north and the main public entrance to the cutaway located off of Nawi Cove. Inside the cliff face is entirely exposed. Defined by the existing cliff face that runs more than 200 meters, linear openings were added to allow a flood of natural daylight to wash the natural stone face, illuminating the, illuminating the space and providing natural ventilation. A continuous, a continuous series of art installations, public and corporate events are currently taking place in, in the interim space. The following computer renderings helped explain to our client what we described as the park facade, which covers the cutaway. The foreshore promenade, promenade with a low sandstone wall known as the 1836 wall marks the original 1836 shore, shoreline. The wall separates a decomposed granite multi-use path from an asphalt bicycle path. Below, a bushwalk shows a more intimate experience of the bush landscape. The dramatic views of the great Western lawn looking north towards the Sydney Harbor Bridge and looking back up the northern slope from the new foreshore. In September 2014, after about one and a half years of construction, the headland outline is, uh, was complete and the cultural center takes shape. Here's another view from the south, uh, south side, looking into the cutaway. The cultural space is being readied for the roof beams to be installed so the park can be, can be rolled out on top. I'd like to briefly describe how the headland form was interpreted. Early images such as this painting by Major Taylor, in addition to existing cliff profiles and geomorphologic studies, offered solid clues about Miller's Point's original headland form. The red line in the original 1836 shoreline overlaid onto the container port. Nawi Cove separates Barangaroo Reserve from central Barangaroo and the urban districts. The new, new cove completes the district 
shape of the headland uh, shoreline and creates opportunities for harbor views close to the Hickson Boulevard. These early diagrams define the headland from that one uh, form that once existed before it was cut back to the existing cliff face. The Western profile on the bottom image describes how the slope rises gently up from the north and becomes steep at the south end. We began by making many three-dimensional models of the headland form, and we calculated the volumes of soil that would be required for each alternate. This form is the option that was adopted. The Sydney headland, headlands in their natural form are examples of pure bush. We were determined to create the original rich, complicated, and more interesting plant composition for the form of the headland to add a dimension of naturalness to the overall park. The bush landscape is stunning in its density of form when viewed from the harbor, but it is complex and layered when you're inside it, offering beautiful views through the canopy to the water. First, we needed to define a steeper section, which required a series of one meter retaining walls. This would increase the slope well beyond the three to one natural angle of repose shown with the red line. The dense understory would eventually cover the low retaining walls. The foreshore promenade is on the left, the bush walk runs mid slope, and the upper bluff path runs at the top. The bush is the most complex ecology in Barangaroo Reserve, and the plant typologies change from the western slope shown here compared to the more moist and shadier south facing slopes. It, can, it consists of three separate planting layers a ground cover layer of plants from about half a meter to two meters in height, an understory of plants up to about five meters in height, and a canopy layer of trees 10 to 20 meters in height that forms a serious, series of uh, cathedral-like spaces. Incorporating native Sydney plants such as large angorphoras, banksias, eucalyptus, and Port Jackson figs, the vegetation strictly follows the native bush ecology. Like the, like the mature bush uh, environment shown here. Just as Miller's Point was excavated in the 19th century to provide materials for the heritage buildings of Sydney, Barangaroo Reserve was, uh, has been constructed from sandstone extracted 100% directly from the site. But, we be, but when we began, no one knew how to do this. We again looked at the headland foreshores of Sydney Harbor, where we found many beautiful examples of eroded tidal sandstone bases. They are, highly, they are highly attractive for all kinds of recreation, swimming, fishing, tide pooling, sunbathing, etc. We thought that Barangaroo would be successful if we could recreate this waterside attraction, but we didn't know how to do it. On one of our visits, we went to a place called Langs Point Reserve in Watson's Bay which had a natural tessellated uh, sandstone phenomena where the sandstone stones have fallen in this geometric geologic strike angle, which is specific in its alignment to Sydney Harbor. We then thought that if you take manufacture blocks of sandstone, which come in large rectangles and place them together in lines, then we might have a solution for a naturalistic outcome. We water jet blasted the stones to test the weathering effects. On the bottom left is a saw cut stone. And in about 10 minutes with the water jet, the image on the right shows the eroded stone effect. We made scale models with specific stand, sandstone block sizes to try and understand all of the different ways that the blocks could be set out. We took into consideration the two meters of tidal change, which made it clear that the foreshore, foreshore space would never remain static. Then we were ready to understand. When we were re then we were ready to understand more about how to construct the foreshore. A full-scale uh, prototype was made on site to improve our understanding of how the large blocks could be moved into place and the comfortable seat heights uh, between blocks uh, would be accessible and attractive to people of all ages to play on them. Foreshore construction began at the north end of the site. Uh, behind the existing concrete caissons. The stone was excavated from the middle of the site, processed to the correct dimensions of the plan, and placed in its uh, final position at the perimeter. 
The 37,000 cubic meters of Sydney's iconic Hawkesbury sandstone that created the new foreshore was excavated from massive slabs cut with three meter diameter blades to the size spe specifications defined by a 3D Revit model. And then each block barcoded and GPS located into their specific foreshore placements. The block sizes range from about 1.2 meters width by up to five meters in length. Here I am with the chief stone mason, Stro uh, Troy Strati, inspecting the quality of the first extracted sandstone blocks. The blocks were moved to a site stockpile and barcoded for their specific locations in the new foreshore. On October of 2013, the first blocks were placed at the north end of the site following the strike angle that we talked about before. And it would take about uh, one year to finish about a kilometer of shoreline. Blocks placed behind the existing caisson provided wave protection from the harbor. As time passes, the 10,000 uh, uh, placed sandstone blocks will soften by exposure to sea, wind, and sun. After the new foreshore was placed, the concrete caissons were saw cut three meters below low tide by divers and uh, then removed to expose the first new Barangaroo foreshore on Sydney Harbor. Mature fig trees were then moved into the foreshore planting areas to provide the shade and an enhanced naturalistic effect. Simon, simultaneously, other prototypes were being created for, for design review. Here we're checking out the construction toler tolerances for the Naui Cove Amphitheater. How to form a naturalistic rock outcropping. And, and our first installed rock outcropping, which is less naturalistic and rather mysterious. And the grand staircases where huge sandstone blocks rising from the foreshore flank more refined sandstone steps. The tessellated sandstone foreshore earlier seen at Lang's Reserve in Watson's Bay, shown on the left during the design phases of the project, have now been realized at Barangaroo Reserve, shown on the right. The Barangaroo Reserve blocks are set out on the identical Sydney geologic strike angle as Watson's Bay. And the, uh, and the Barangaroo strike angle in its finished form. Thin slabs of sandstone arranged like shingles gently slope through the tidal zone and transition into slabs of terraced sandstone that create broad seat high steps. All of the nearly one kilometer foreshore at Barangaroo Reserve has been designed to enc uh, encourage people to get close to the water. The foreshore walk at Barangaroo Reserve is broad in scale in order to accommodate thousands of different users. The 1836 wall separates bicycles and pedestrians. The adjacent sandstone provides thousands of unique variations leading down to the water, while the bush landscape defines the uphill side of the promenade. The primary ent entrance to, uh, to the reserve at the north end of the park is marked by solid sand sandstone entrance columns that are five meters tall and one meter by one meter uh, in dimension. As you enter the park, the 1836 wall leads your eye out to the water. The foreshore promenade passes by several wide grassy beach areas where visitors can move out beyond the promenade to be closer to the water. There are many ways to use the, uh, and experience the promenade. Another broad grassy beach area. The more architectural layout of the sandstone at Naui Cove allows for regular waterside events to occur, to occur for up to 2,000 people or for the enjoyment of smaller groups. The slope up to the upper bluff offers space for passive recreation uh, or large concerts to uh, happen such as New Year's Eve uh, where everybody can view the Harbor Bridge. And at the uh, entrance to the cutaway, a playful star-shaped layout of stone and a field of lamandras inviting for children to explore while they're waiting to go into the, the cutaway. One of the grand staircases adjacent to the cultural facility entrance at Naui Cove. 
which marches right up from the foreshore all the way to the top of the headland. At the Nowy Cove Amphitheater, you can see Duke's Pier that becomes an entertainment stage on the left and the headland to the right. The headland formed by Nowy Cove dramatizes the many ways of experiencing the park. Three pathways could be seen from this vista point, the upper bluff path, the foreshore promenade below, and, and the signature Corten wall marking the bush walk in the center. The intimately scaled bush walk runs up slope from the foreshore walk. Several small staircases meander up through the bush landscape connecting the different levels. An immersive bush experience with filtered views to the water. Native planting competes the completes the naturalistic foreshore composition. And here are park visitors enjoying the view from one of the grassy beaches. Barangaroo Reserve has become a new iconic landscape for Sydney uh, with views, you know, completed views to the, the older icons. The design of the Barangaroo Reserve is a waterfront typology rarely seen adjacent to a highly urbanized central business district. Within Sydney's urban context, this naturalistic vocabulary falls within a, the noble tradition of great urban parks such as New York Central Park as, com as a completely manipulated idea of nature and a monumental scale. Barangaroo is extremely integrated into the historic fabric of the city and the harbor. And one of the most integrated concept, concepts of the reserve itself is the dedication of the park as reparation to the indigenous community. This has a meaningful, uh, a meaningful and physical significance to Sydney siders, immersing visitors in a visual, emotional, and historic experience. The park is heavily curated and programmed. Many events, events occur like this indigenous performance at Nowy Cove, where the promenade becomes the stage. Nowy Cove is one of the great meeting places in the park or along the grand staircase, staircases as another way to watch people moving about. The park has thousands, thousands of ways to be experienced by people of all ages, like yoga on Saturday mornings on top of the headland at the Stargazer Lawn, where the best views of the Sydney skyline can be seen, or performances at Duke's Pier overlooking Nowy Cove as well as interim events at the cutaway, such as an uh, ab, uh, indigenous dance festival. And all in respect to the Aboriginal elders past and present. From the beginning, the city of Sydney uh, has Im imagined Barangaroo as a great opportunity to showcase the city as a world leader in sustainability. Barangaroo's goal is to be the first precinct of its size in the world to be climate positive. Following the principles of the Clinton Climate Initiative, the project strives to be carbon neutral, water positive, generate zero waste, and enhance the well being of the community. To achieve these goals, we recycled all existing site materials, including the concrete caissons, as components for the structural fill and for the blending of topsoil from the sandstone quarry. From the sandstone quarry. All of the sandstone was extracted from the site to construct the foreshore, eliminating thousands of deliveries to the site. Planting is 100% native species. Uh, marine and wildlife habitat has been promoted with, uh, within the public domain. There's enough on-site solar energy to support LED lighting systems in the public domain and capturing 100% of the rainwater required for the irrigation. Barangaroo is aiming for net positive water, which means the precinct is producing more clean water than it uses. The construction of Barangaroo Reserve, Barangaroo Reserve has been a truly unique design construct process. On my more than 40 trips to Sydney over six years, I saw that everyone on the, on the site became involved with the project, um, uh, uh, project from design consultants, government officials, and, and all of the people constructing the park. They all immediately became proud to be part of a legacy that would change the city forever. Perhaps the successful outcome is because of the project, uh, 
being surrounded by one of the world's most beautiful harbors and the deep layering of history and culture reflecting upon the foundation of Australia. We are regularly in talks with the Sydney Harbor Foreshore Authority relating to the ongoing uh, prospect of completing Central Barangaroo, which has been delayed by the pandemic. And while the uh, pandemic has slowed things down considerably, we are uh, delighted to see six years out the Sydney Harbor bush landscape maturing and the remarkable biodiversity that, had, that was built into the planting plan, which is now in full display. Here are some impressions of the current waterfront edge. Some views around the stone circle uh, uh, outcrops on the northern side of the site and harbor front lawn areas that have now become quite mature after five or six years of growth. Uh, immersive views within the landscape from the bushwalk, which is quite intimate. Uh, and views from the top of the headland back down towards the water. Um, we're, we're really happy at how successful the planting is on the site and, uh, and, and that it's really performing very well. Um, in conclusion, I hope that each of you can someday visit Sydney and experience Barangaroo for yourselves. I know it's a long ways to go, but it's worth the trip, not just for Barangaroo, but to, to explore that country. It's a wonderful place. And I'd like to, and I'd like to finish by showing you a short uh, film um, that will give you a very good impression of the massive building process and the positive cultural outcome. So let me switch here for a second. Here.
the spirits of my ancestors walk beside you, protect you whilst you're on Gadigal land, as I know they walk beside and protect me. I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. It puts a bit more significance on the event, really, so. So once again, respects to um, elders past and present and to the traditional owners. Thank you all very much. And with that, I think we can uh, yeah. have a discussion, take questions. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And um, before the Q&A section, I am very curious um, to our audience who has been able to visit the Burn Group. You can use your, you can raise your hands or you can just talk on the chat window. Is anyone have been there before? Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, I saw, uh, yeah, one person say, oh, there's someone have a visit. Sure. Okay. Um, so we, I think we can start a Q&A. Is there anyone have a question to Dave? You can uh, use um, the chat box or just throw it up. Hi, I'll go ahead and ask a question. This is Kelly Ann Foster. I, I had hoped I had planned to go to uh, Sydney in fall of 19 and I had to delay my trip to spring of 2020. And of course we know what happened, but this was high on my list to go and visit. Um, in fact, I, um, I'm at Penn State and we had a study abroad group going over there and I sent them all this information about, it. I said, you have to go see this because they were looking at cultural and arts things. So my, my question to you is, and it's phenomenal and all the work and all the energy, it's so exciting. But are there anything, you've obviously learned some lessons, are there any things that you wish you would have approached differently or, or um, done differently? Um, I mean, because it just looks so perfect and wonderful, but I wonder if there's, in hindsight, if you're looking at things and thinking, ah, oh, wish we would have done something else. Well, there were some things that we had the opportunity to improve. We made, the last trip I made over there in 2017, they were asking, um, for more planting on the top of the stargazer lawn, uh, because shade was shade's a huge issue in uh, in Australia. The sun is really intense, so shade is king there. And we, I don't think we planted enough trees on the top. Um, so we had an opportunity to go back, make some nursery visits, and add to the park. So I think those have been in now for some time now. I think they're they're probably taking quite well as well. So we had an opportunity to fix that. Um, uh, you know, I, in terms of, in terms of completing the project, I think we, I think, I think we pretty much got whatever we want. They were a great client, um, and we had the opportunity to, to go back and fix things. And we also had, um, we had a good relationship with Paul Keating, who was the former prime minister, who is our, um, was the champion of the project. He came up with the idea of recreating a headland as a sort of reparations for the indigenous culture of Sydney. And so we had his ear and we were able to suggest things that we couldn't achieve within the contract that we had. And they're, they're, um, they're doing some of those things gradually. Um, so I think, I think all in all, uh, fantastic client. You know, they, they realize the asset that they've created and they're, they're willing to invest in it. it I have to say one thing about that, um, this park, really uh, created a, a tremendous value for the rest of the development. Um, the high-rise buildings that I showed you in the, in the, uh, in the beginning, 
those are all complete now. And I think there's, I don't know, 15,000 people working there. And um, the park really sold the, helped sell the development uh, tremendously. Um, so they were willing to invest a lot to make that right, considering how much money they were getting back from that, that very large scale development. Well, congratulations. That's, that's especially, it's, you know, well, over 10 years now you've been working on it, right? Because it was, yeah, that's really exciting. Thank you. It's, it's still ongoing. We have, uh, you know, the subway, uh, the metro, as they call it, uh, came on after we completed the project because of the success of Barangaroo South, the, the development to the south, and the success of the park. Well, what did they decide to do? They decided to put a subway stop, a metro stop, right at Nowy Cove. So you come out of the subway from underground, and you're right in the right in the entrance to the park. But subways take a long time to build, like two, you know, three years, <laughs> which sounds short, right? But in Australian time, that's that's uh, they're they're different than we are. Um, so that's all being put back together, and that's a big component of how Barangaroo Central will uh, will continue, because you'll be dropped. You know, your first uh, your first exit will be right at Barangaroo Central at Nowy Cove. Anybody else? Yeah, this is Ari. Can I ask a question? Sure. No worry. Hi, uh, David. Uh, congratulations! This is an amazing project. Couple of question about the cost of the project. Number one, did you know how much it's going to cost at the very beginning? Number two, um, did uh, the, your client was it a shocking uh, to get the cost? And how did they really finance it? I know you talked about it. This uh, there was a big development that was part of it, but yeah. somebody had to pay upfront for this park. And um, so, if you can just talk about a little bit about the sure. uh, value of public infrastructure investment. I hope I'm not remembering. I hope I'm remembering right. I think it's a $125 million for the park, which included the underground space, a lot of our, you know, structure and all that. So 125 million. I think it um, we were uh, mostly on budget, except for some uh, environmental issues that were discovered, which pushed the numbers up a little bit. Um, and in terms of the financing, what <clears throat> what the Barangaroo Delivery Authority did was they 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 uh, they had a, a competition with uh, three developer teams uh, uh, to gain the development rights for Barangaroo South, which is very dense uh, buildings, 200 meter tall buildings, and uh, and that that the money that they got from that was going to pay for everything. In that in that scale of of things, the, the amount of money that they were getting from Barangaroo South, 100 million dollars was not a lot, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so it allowed it allowed for some very extraordinary things to happen. Um, so that was good. I think uh, we'll see how it goes with Barangaroo Central. Not quite as dense. Hey David, this is Kathy. Congratulations, that's a great project. And hello, um, I have a quick question for you. Uh, were you concerned or what's the thoughts about erosion of the sandstone that's in the water? We're, we're yeah. not allowed to put any water on any of our down on the entire Stanford campus. That, that's like a given. Yeah. So, you know, we had really good, ge we had a great team actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the geotechnical consultants were obviously uh, important. So was the marine engineer. So between the marine engineer and the geotechnical who was analyzing the sandstone that was being extracted from the site, um, all those calculations were made very carefully. And um, they, they, they say that, <laughs> it's a strange thing to say, but because those blocks are so large, mm -hmm. they can allow for a certain amount of erosion to happen. And I forgot what the number is. It's a, I don't know, a centimeter a year or something, not yeah. that much. It's, it's some, you know, 50 millimeters a year would erode. And so they put kind of a number on how long it would last. And it was, it was in the 75 to 100 years, whatever that means. I don't know what it would look like at that point. But because the, basically, to answer your question, because the blocks are so large, yeah. the erosion was welcome, right? Okay. Uh, and, and the other thing about the blocks is that they weren't set, uh, they weren't mortared, mortared in place. So when the wave action comes in, um, the blocks are resting on top of a, a ballast and that allows them to be flexible to move. They wanted them to move a little bit. 
Um, so it's not a rigid, a rigid foreshore. Uh, so water is designed to move, move through those stones. Um, and, and that's just how, how it was engineered. But to, to answer your question about erosion, that, that was calculated. Um, okay. I don't know what we'll do in, <laughs> what they'll do in. <laughs> but, Thanks. I, I saw the chat box has uh, Krista. Do you have a question? Do you wanna ask him, Dave? Yeah, I had a question after seeing the video and just seeing all the people that are involved in the project and the building. A couple of questions around that is like, how many people roughly worked on this project start to finish? And did you go with local people or did project teams that you've worked with uh, here in the past? How did that all come together? Well, it was a design construct project. So they, um, they got uh, offers from three different large construction companies. And uh, <clears throat> we, we had the opportunity to talk to all of them and uh, review their proposals. And we, um, I had met one of the reasons that we chose, uh, that we were happy that they chose the people that we recommended was because of the stonemason who we had met very early in the, in the, um, in the design process. Troy Strati is his name. And he's a remarkable uh, person. He actually, he and his father invented the, the saws that cut that stone. So they knew how to excavate stone, stone in downtown Sydney and elsewhere uh, in highly in urban environments, how to open up quarries in the middle of the city. So we knew that he had the knowledge and probably the, uh, uh, the courage to take on a project where we didn't really know all the answers about how to do it. So, um, so it was a design construct uh, process, and uh, I was I was uh, asked by the government to make the trips during the construction phases, which was a number of years, to uh, be over there working inside the uh, the uh, the job trailer with the contractors, working out problems as they came along, and really designing designing a lot of the things as they came along. Uh, so that was a good, that turned out to be a very good relationship actually. And, uh, uh, and we worked pretty well together. Um, probably about 350 people at its peak were working on the project, um, of all disciplines, you know, they were building a, a huge uh, space underneath. So there was a lot of architecture going on and a lot of landscape going on and a lot of it, civil engineering, obviously for the foreshore uh, and marine engineering. Okay, uh, there has a question from the Michael Oguro from the chat box. Uh, he is asking how did construction document and the record document go? A local landscape architects and all engineering had to stamp the plan and the specifications. Yeah, we worked with a partner uh, called Johnson Pilton Walker in Sydney. And they're mostly an architecture firm that has a smaller group of landscape architects. Uh, we worked through the initial uh, detailed design with them, which is, I guess, what you'd call kind of advanced uh, design development in our in our language. Uh, and so we worked through to a certain point. Um, uh, we did the design development in our terms, and then we handed it to them, and they made um, close to bid documents. But they were they got them. They didn't get them. Uh, completely uh, tied down. They got them to a point where they could hire the um, hire the design build uh, contractor, and there were still quite a lot of things, a lot of major things to work out um, on in the design. So it, the the design kind of ran all the way through it. Um, JPW was responsible. Our local partners, Johnson, Pilton, Walker, they were responsible for putting the specifications together, and uh, and we worked with them pretty closely all the way through the process to uh, deal with uh, local suppliers and local uh, codes and so forth. We got along pretty well. And, you know, in these projects where you're working overseas, uh, you have to have a client that's willing to uh, uh, pay you enough to keep going. We're, the World Trade Center was like that. Novartis campus was certainly like that. And Barangaroo was like that. Without without the funding for you to do what you need to do with the local uh, the local uh, team members, pretty hard to get get your vision uh, realized in full. 
Um, and we've only we've only had a couple of opportunities where we were able to go all the way to the end like this. Most of the time you're doing design development, and handing it off to somebody, and then you know you go back and look at it when it's almost finished. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just just a coincidence you had the same last name in there. <laughs> yes, just a coincidence. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you, Mike. Um, is there any other question? We might take last question because of the time. Well, I hope you all can get over there after all of this pandemic stuff goes away. Uh, it's a place, I don't know how many of you are from San Francisco Bay Area, but it's, it reminds me, Sydney reminds me so much of, of uh, living in San Francisco. It's a wonderful place for culture and food and wine. And it's very progressive uh, in their attitudes and their social uh, agendas. And uh, it's just a, you feel very, very at home being there. So I really recommend uh, going there and visiting and moving there if you can. All right. Cool, is, uh, if there are not any, oh, is there Owen? Oh. Hey, I just want to say hi to Kathy and hi to David. Owen, hi. Hi. Hey, I know it's, it's Long been time. years. It's been a lot of years. And, um, and I want to say hi to Laura. I didn't get the prompt to join the Zoom until my wife loaded it, and that's Joan Cooper. So I, I've learned in the last few days how to change my name on Zoom. Uh, well, that's it's great to see you. I, it's been but such I just fun. wanted to say, uh, I really, uh, I didn't get all of it, but when you said that the project then had the underground rail subway come into it, um, it reminded me of <clears throat> uh, the kind of complexities that we, those of us that have had the fortune to live through complex projects uh, will understand. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that that system came after the fact. And I've worked on ones that they planned for the rail stop and then built the development over it. And I remember the agony of how that would work and you built something after the fact. It's like a knee replacement, but having a change in the part, you know? Well, you know, Australia moves quickly because they're controlled by the state, as opposed to here where every jurisdiction has a say yeah. over what happens. So, you know, we worked on Transbay, right? There, there's not even a train station in it. And now every little town is looking at how are they gonna move rail? through their town, high-speed rail through their town. And I don't, nobody expects it to happen in their lifetime, you know? And yet in Australia, because it's state controlled, they made it happen in, in the course of one uh, 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 political cycle. So something to be learned from there. Very impressive. Okay, thank you, Dave, and thank you all the people come to this uh, sessions. And I'm going to wrapping up, and and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.